So the question is, what big risk stands in the way of you and your dream life and your dream job? I call it jumping off the cliff. And today, I'm very excited to introduce you to somebody that I know has done that over and over again. And because of that, I'm happy to call him a friend, a colleague, and somebody that I want to share his story with uh, to you. His name is Craig Heimbuck. Now, Craig Heimbuck has been the ghostwriter or the author of over 15 books, has traveled the world as a guest lecturer, and has pitched some of the largest brands in the world for one of the biggest companies in the world as well. So I'm excited to bring him out here. We're going to talk to him, and he's going to tell us what he does differently every day that we need to learn from. Welcome to the next 24 hours, where I'm going to give you real information you can really use to transform your life and work one day at a time. I'll be your host, Curtis Zimmerman. So I've mentioned in the past that I'm lucky enough to travel around the United States and part of the world, and I get to meet some amazing people. And today, we're going to meet a very good friend of mine, a colleague, and somebody I've worked with on several projects, and I hope to work on more moving forward. His name is Craig Heimbuck, and Craig Heimbuck's going to share a lot of interesting things and things he does differently. But I thought just before that happened, I'd give you a little more backstory on him. Now, it's interesting because Craig's family, he comes from a, a whole line of scientists and really crazy smart people, and he's crazy smart too, but he decided to go a little bit different direction and uh, go ahead and get an English major. Now, you might be saying, what are you going to do with that? How are you going to make a living with that? Well, he did go ahead and work for several different uh, magazines, and it's interesting because Craig was working during some major events like 9-11, and he was at Ground Zero, and just the experiences and the talks we've had about those types of topics, like covering anthrax and you know working for different magazines and interviewing lots and lots and lots of people, gives Craig a totally different kind of perspective on the world and the way that it works. That's what I'm excited about sharing with you as well today. So uh, we have Craig on the phone. Craig, welcome to the next 24 hours. How are you doing today? Oh, well, thank you for having me. I'm doing great, my friends. A uh, little tired because I came in on a, a late night flight last night, but uh, excited to be talking to you. You know, it's interesting growing up as an artist myself and being surrounded by so many different performers and artists. Uh, it's interesting because as you get into something and you're so passionate about it, you just want to do it all day, every day, and you love it so much. But I also know there comes a point as an artist, there comes a point as a, a writer, there comes a point as a human being where you say, actually, you know what, I need the world now to start giving me a little bit back from what I'm giving out every day. And I know you had kind of a tipping point, and we had that together. I'd love for you to touch on that. So you're talking about the night, you know, capital T, capital N. Um, first of all, thank you for calling me an artist. I never view myself that way. I view myself as a craftsman, right? Like, because I, I am not Leonardo da Vinci going off trying to create a masterpiece. I am absolutely using what I do to solve a problem. So that's why I look at it as a, as a craftsman, uh, kind of a craft of what I do. But uh, I had been working at a, at a magazine. I was the managing editor of a, um, a series, uh, like a chain of uh, home and garden magazines. Uh, it was a lot of work, and, and it was great. And I thought, man, this is, it doesn't get any better than this. And then uh, the economy took a hit. And when you work in home and garden magazines – um, and they stop building houses, that means there's no advertising to pay for the magazines. And they came to me um, on a Friday evening, like right as I was leaving work, and it was, it was a rough time to be in those offices, and the publisher called me in and said, Craig, you know, you know we love you. You are the, the heart and soul of, this, of these magazines. We're not going to lay you off, but we need you to take a – like a, I think it was like a 20% pay reduction. So I was moving backwards, right? And the memory of having been laid off for six months and collecting unemployment while, you know, taking care of my wife who's nine months pregnant and still teaching because she's the breadwinner, all of that was, came like rushing back. And I just felt this incredible sense of shame, like immediately. And I also knew with my background, I didn't have a lot of options, right? I mean, newspapers were dying everywhere. 
I thought, you know, lifestyle magazines, those will go on forever, but they won't when the economy takes a, a dive. And I just thought, man, I can't do this anymore, right? I can't, I can't walk up to my wife uh, and tell her I had failed one more time. You know what I mean? Uh, it happened to be that we were going to a party that night at a mutual friend of ours, Curtis, um, and I took my time. I drove a long, uh, around for a long time, and I was going to meet my wife and kids at the party, and I pulled up, and I just sat in my car, and I was watching the sunset, and I was like, ugh. I made a bad choice. I, like I said, I'm, I've always been pushing myself to validate the decision I made to follow the path that I made. And I walked up and I told my wife and I said, I'm so sorry. I don't think I can go into this party. Um, this is what happened. I don't have a choice. I'm going to have to do more work for less money just to say that I have a job. And my wife is wonderful. She gives me a big hug. She says, you know what? We are going to be fine but you need to be fine first. You need to go find Curtis. At this time, we had already worked on a project together. We hit it, hit it off like like uh, gangbusters. And you were also the only person who seemed to really understand the path that somebody uh, walks when they take sort of a non-traditional path. I mean, it, mine looks textbook compared to your path to where you've gotten, but, um, uh, and also understand sort of the, the feeling I was having. And so I walked in and we were standing in the kitchen. I don't know if you remember this crowded party. Uh, and you came and you said, hi, as you always do, you have this great way of making people feel alone in a room. And, uh, we stood, we stood next to the, 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 the oven and I told you what happened. And it was like that scene in Goodwill Hunting. Uh, I don't know if you remember where where Will finally starts to admit to Sean, to, to Robin Williams, the abuse that, that he grew up with. Uh, and Robin Williams gets in his face and says, it's not your fault. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I know. He's like, no, it's not your fault. And you kept saying that to me and getting like uncomfortably close. You said, I'm going to pay your bills for six months. So you're going to walk in on Monday and quit. And it was like a light bulb went off. Like at first I doubted what you were saying because no one had ever done anything that generous for me. Um, but I, I, it was like, yes, that's exactly what I need to do. So I walked in on Monday morning and I quit my job. I put in my two weeks notice. Um, and on the very last day of that two weeks, the publisher came to me as I'm like walking out with my, my box of stuff. And he said, what do we have to do to convince you to stay? And I said, I want my original salary and I want to stay home with my kids so that I stop having to pay um, uh, child care. I'm going to work when I want, where I want. I'll come in at night. And they said, fine. And so I spent nine months, um, working from home, working for you one day a week. And, uh, I got to spend nine months with my, my two oldest kids. And, uh, that led me to the, the advertising agency I've been at for nine years. Um, it was this moment where, we, we, we have this tendency to hold on to table scraps thinking it's a feast um, because we don't think that there will ever be food again. You know what I mean? I felt like I had to, I had to take what they were giving me uh, because I didn't believe in myself enough to think that I could go get something better. And you just sort of went, nope, that's not good enough. Quit your job. And, and it's so, so important that we push out that um, I didn't say, I'll just pay your bills because I'm a nice guy. I said, Craig, you have so many skills, so many things we can use. Um, I want to write my uh, a book. I need a ghostwriter. So you know what? Go in, quit your job. I guarantee for the next six months, I will be able to cover, you know, with the Curtis Zimmerman group, we'll be able to handle all the bills, everything you need, but you need to get out of there because I know as soon as you get out of there and you see all the other possibilities, that boy, your world, your world's going to change overnight because this is not, they're not treating you correctly. And, and that's exactly what happened and very excited to be a part of that story. But again, you're the one that did all the work. You're the one that made all the changes. You're the, I say it all the time in my program. I cannot um, motivate anyone. I can hopefully inspire them and show them ways to change their life, but they have to do all the work. And that's really why I wanted to talk to you about the next 24 hours uh, and, and have you on the program is you've done that over and over and over and you continue to do it because you jumped off that cliff that day just 10 years ago. Um, all of those skills 
give you a unique set of skills, I think, for what you're doing right now. Will you tell us a little bit about that? I believe, and, and this is something that I learned through journalism and uh, through a, a, a sort of a code that there's, there's only six questions that you can ask. And they're the six questions you were taught in second grade, right? Who, what, where, when, why, and how. And I can walk into any room, and if I can answer those six questions, I can kind of achieve the desired outcome. I won't say I'll get what I want because it's not necessarily what I want. It's just I, if I can understand who people are, what motivates them? What do they want to achieve? Why is it important that they achieve that? And then when, where, and how they think they're going to achieve it, um, I, I feel pretty confident that I can that I can do that. So over over nine years in the agency world, I have um, pitched and won something like forty million dollars worth of business. Um, in the agency world, you plan on winning about ten percent of your pitches. I don't keep score, but I keep track. You know what I mean? Uh, and I think I'm at about seventy five percent. And I think it's because every interaction, every project, every um, uh, business, every product is always about people, right? It's always about um, the people you're trying to, to reach and the things they want to hear. So I, I just did a workshop in Nashville the day before yesterday with a very major um, a company in the, the alcohol industry, um, uh, they were trying to figure out, you know, what can we do to our sales materials to sell ultra premium products? And it, in two hours, we were able to realize that their sales materials aren't the problem. Their products are not what people are buying. That's what they're selling. And there's a big difference, right? We think that we are selling this widget that we made, but what we're so we focus so hard on making the best widget we possibly can uh, when if we had taken half the effort to figure out what problem someone is trying to solve with that widget, we wouldn't have to sell it, right? Because we would focus on what they're buying, what people are buying when they're buying ultra premium um, uh, wine is they're buying assurance that the gift they're giving to someone they care about is good. Uh, they're buying a moment that they will... Um, share with friends. They're buying um, a, a timeout where, you know, in the hectic, busy world of, of people with kids and jobs and all that stuff, the ability to sit down and enjoy wine with your spouse and uh, friends, that's what they're buying. So stop selling them the awards on the bottle and start talking about what they're buying. It's a pretty simple philosophy that I learned from covering politics, right? The, 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 you know, people, people buy the headline, um, uh, even if you're trying to sell them the thousand page budget, you know what I mean? And so it, it, if you can understand that there's, there's nothing that you can't, um, uh, there's no, there's no room you, you can't walk into. Right. And so I walked into a room in Brazil once where I was giving a talk where I was literally the only person who spoke English and I had to figure out how am I going to give an hour long talk uh, to these people and they're all wearing the UN headphones and uh, all that stuff. And I think, I think you have to go out and you have to develop the muscle memory. You have to be brave enough to fail, but have a, a code or a system by which you can diagnose a failure. And for me, it's those six questions, who, what, where, when, why, and how, right? And if you can do that um, and so that you're always learning from mistakes and you're always learning from failure and you're always pushing yourself sort of forward um, it's amazing the opportunities that come out of it. I'm sure you've seen this a million times, Curtis. When you when you started as a speaker, you were talking to Rotary clubs for free at the public library, and now you walk into Disney. You're still the same guy. You still see the world the exact same way. It's just that you figured out how to make a message carry, and you figured out how to to take what you learned at the Rotary and apply it to uh, you know whoever you're going to go talk to, Procter and Gamble, right? And um, I, I think that that comes from muscle memory and it comes from experience and it comes from a humility that you know when you go out there, it's probably not going to be perfect. So you go out planning on learning from it so that the next one's a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. And next thing you know, the, the world just kind of opens up. <clears throat> Having that code means no one, you're not reliant on any one person to tell you what you did wrong. You are constantly looking at what did I do wrong? What can I learn from? How can I make it better? And then you just say yes to every opportunity 
because every opportunity, it's like, it's, it's another opportunity to sharpen your ax. I just have to say that it's so important for everyone who's listening to remember and for me to remember that this isn't a laser focus on one thing. This is the way of looking at your life. I can't let you go without making sure everyone understands that Craig is, when you talk about a lifetime learner, when you talk about somebody that reads a lot of books and then goes and tries these things, um, I have to make sure everybody gets that. It isn't like he's sitting back and just waiting for the world to give him what he wants. He's actively engaged in order to make the world, he demands the world to give him what he wants and what he needs and what he knows he deserves because he did the work. And some of those things we've talked about over the last few years is just like for the fun of it, hey, I'm going to download this app and I'm going to learn Spanish. I don't know Spanish, but I'm going to learn Spanish. Yeah. And I know you, you did that just for the fun of it, 10, 15 minutes a day. I know that you read somewhere in a book that, you know, it's really healthy for you to take an ice cold shower or get a shower and at the last four minutes, turn it to freezing cold. Uh, I know that's crazy. And I tried it one day and I called you and told you it was crazy, <laughs> but I know you did that because you heard about it and you tried it. I have a couple questions before we let you go. Sure. Uh, the first question is, uh, what do you do in the typical 24 hours? Uh, just, you know, quickly kind of your day. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, if you'd highlight the one or two things that you do that most of us don't do that you recommend we start doing. So I think um, I like to start every single day by learning. Um and so I, you, after I get the kids off to school and I, I get to the office, the first thing I do is study a language. So I just did, uh, uh, this morning, I, I did my 314th day in a row of Duolingo Spanish, and it took eight minutes. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, some big, long, drawn-out process. Um, I, I typically write a journal every day, but it's not a... Um, a big long, Oh, woe is me. Lord, I hope that I can, um, uh, become something someday. It's like, here's three things I did yesterday. And then I pick a sentence that I want to focus on for the day. So today was, uh, um, I Craig Heimbuck will be generous. And I write it 15 times and you'd be surprised how through the rest of the day, you just find yourself finding opportunities to do that thing. Um, to be generous yesterday was I will lead with patience because I knew I was leading a big workshop and every time I started feeling frustrated, I remembered that sentence that came back to me. And then I'll write down like two cool things that are coming today and two things I have to do today. So I wrote down, I'm pitching a TV show today and I'm talking to Curtis and I have to do my timesheets or I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, and I have to send an invoice for something that I did, right? It, it takes five minutes to do that journal. Um, I, will, I will write every day. I will uh, read every day grand total of 40 minutes. I mean, it's, it's not like there's, you got 24 hours in a day. I haven't even filled an hour yet and I've gotten so many things done. <clears throat> I typically make my bed every day uh, unless my wife is still asleep in it, but with a young kid at home, she's not. Um, uh, it, it, getting something done the second you wake up makes a, a big difference. Um, I wish I could go four minutes in a cold shower. I typically do about 45 seconds right at the end of the shower. Uh, and it wakes me up. It's better than a cup of coffee. And I experience pain first thing in the day. It, it makes me braver for the rest of the day. That's, that's what I read. Uh, and I think it was a Tim Ferriss book. And that's what I do. Um, I will go for walks when I'm stuck. Uh, I also practice scarcity. So if, I, if I'm on a roll writing and my 30 minutes is up, I stop. That takes a lot more discipline than keeping going. Uh, I have stopped in the middle of typing words on a project before because my timer went off. Um, and it's because I want to spend the next 23 and a half hours thinking about what's the next word that's going to come. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So I look for little opportunities to iterate, to do something to get a little bit better every single day. And then the cumulative effect is I was riding the MARTA yesterday, the, the, the train in Atlanta. Uh, and I've been studying Spanish for, like I said, 314 days, and I understood all the Spanish language announcements that came over the, the thing. Wow, that's awesome. 
that was the first time it had ever happened to me. So I'm going to test myself. I don't speak it very well. I don't have a great tongue for language, but I have a pretty good ear. Um, I'm going to go to a Mexican restaurant this weekend and try to talk to the waiter in Spanish just to see if I can do it. If not, oh. I'll do another 314 days until I can. I have a question for you before we let you go. And that is yeah. if people want to find out more about you, I know that you've written several different books. I know that you've written some children's books that are amazing. Sure. How can our listeners go out and, and find some of your things that they can get a, you know, do a deeper dive on Craig Heimbach? So I've got a, a bunch of books on Amazon. Um, I've got a, a Facebook page that's just uh, Craig Heimbach. Uh, they can send me an email. Like I love hearing from people. Um, so if you just send me an email at letters to Craig at gmail dot com, that's T O, not the number two. So um, uh, that's probably the best way. All right. Well, Craig, thank you so much for your time and your insights and. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate you jumping off the cliff every day and spending some time with us to help people navigate the next 24 hours of their life. Congratulations on the show, my friend. I love it. Thanks, my brother. Keep living the dream. You too. Wow, so great to spend a little time and hang out with Craig. But let's talk about the next 24 hours of your life. What are we going to do differently in the next 24 hours? And what are we going to take away from Craig's story? First, I want you to understand Craig Heimbuck didn't become Craig Heimbuck in one day. He actually, it's like a muscle. He worked it over and over. And we talked in the beginning of the podcast about jumping off the cliff, but that's like one thing you do. But I also want us to do the takeaway of the next 24 hours. And that is Craig has installed some habits that he's done for long periods of time to create the changes uh, in the long run. So for instance, he talked about this program that he downloaded to learn Spanish. And it was interesting for me that he talked about it being 314 days. So he knew exactly what his commitment has been up to this time. So for me, the takeaway for you over the next 24 hours is to commit to something that you're going to do for at least 21 days in a row. Now, Remember, it doesn't have to be a giant life-changing thing. It might be, like Craig said, I'm going to commit for the next 21 days to make my bed. (laughs) I'm going to commit for the next 21 days to kiss my spouse every morning when I wake up. I'm going to commit for the next 21 days to get up, get my cup of coffee, sit down, and read something for 15 minutes. I don't care if it's the cookbook. That is how you're going to change the trajectory of of who you are now to who you're going to be. And the payoff may be in 314 days that you'll be on a train, and as they speak to what the next stop is, you'll understand it when they say it in English, but you'll also understand it when they say it in Spanish, like Craig Heimbach did. Let's make the next 24 hours of your life count. Keep living the dream. Hey, thank you for listening to the next 24 hours. It would mean a lot to me if you found this content today valuable that you share it with your friends. Leave me a review. I'd love to hear from you. And if you want to learn more about what I do, it's really simple. Just go to CurtisZimmerman.com. Remember, in order to live the dream, you have to make the next 24 hours count. The clock is ticking.